uh, elite cycling for a long time. And um, here, you know, at, at UCT uh, CESA, we've had the privilege of working with uh, a lot of top athletes starting in 2006 when Ross and I worked with Jan Ulrich and we were actually supposed to go to the Tour de France together with him. And then uh, later with Chris Froome um, and a number of other high profile athletes. And um, we've published a lot in different spaces, in performance testing, in uh, training, in uh, load monitoring, uh, in biomechanics. Uh, and so as a center, we're quite well placed in terms of uh, our knowledge on, on high performance cycling. And that then led to, uh, in 2018, I was approached um, to become part of UAE Team Emirates. And UAE Team Emirates is, is a national project. Um, the UAE is a rapidly uh, developing country, or you could say a very developed country. And with that come the usual problems in terms of population, obesity, an increasing epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And so the leadership in the UAE decided that um, an, a professional team would be a very good catalyst to getting people to exercise. And it has been. In Abu Dhabi, they have an island, Al Hudriyat Island, where the entire island is dedicated to sport now. It started five years ago with a track uh, dedicated to cycling, 24-hour access a day, uh, no traffic at all, just cyclists. And um, it's now used throughout the day by thousands of cyclists um, and, and year-round. It gets a bit difficult in summer. It gets a bit hot in, in July, August. But um, in the other months, uh, it, it's used. And, and they're now building a lot of other sports complexes there and hosting international events. So cycling has taken off, and the team really is a is is the the, uh, the the peak of that project and and the advocacy for getting people on bikes. And we see a lot of people in the Emirates now, Emiratis uh, and expats who live there, who are, are increasingly involved in cycling. So this is just a little bit of a story of the journey that that I've taken with the team since mid twenty eighteen. And um, recently, we were just we were crowned the uh, number one team in the UCI rankings. Uh, and that was the, a five-year-long journey. And so I thought I'll give you guys some insights in terms of some of the things that I've seen that that have been part of that process and how we got there. Um, and so that's what this talk is about. So when I started in 2018 and I met with the team in December 2018, uh, after the first six months, we set about uh, looking at our five-year goals. And the five-year goal that was put forward was one, become the number one team in the world. And the second one was win the Tour de France. And, you know, setting those goals is one thing, but achieving them is, is, is a totally different story. And I'm very happy to say that we actually managed to achieve both, which, uh, which is really a testament to, to how well things have gone. And so how did we get there? Well, 2018 was the year before I got involved. I, I got involved sort of mid-2018, and there was a lot of restructuring that happened. The team was... Previously, an Italian-only team called Lampre Daikin. They were progressively dropping down the rankings. And then when UAE Team Emirates took over as the, or UAE took over as the sponsor, they asked for a, a huge numbers of, a, a huge amount of change to happen. Um, me getting involved was one, just one aspect of that. But there were a lot of changes in the staff and structure. And if we look at what effect that had, had in 2018, the team had a total of 10 victories and was ranked 15th in the world. And the very following year, um, uh, we managed to win 29 races, and uh, we ended up fourth in the team ranking. So already a, a very drastic improvement. And that came without any change in uh, the riders. The team was almost uh, identical to the previous year. So there were very few new athletes. The budget was roughly the same. These are just purely structural changes in, in terms of the process. So you can see that it has a, a dramatic effect. Then the following year, 2020, we won 33 races and we moved up to number three in the world rankings. In 2021, uh, we won one less race, 32 races, so very similar, and we ended up fourth. And then last year, we ended up winning 47 races and second and just being missing out to Jumbo Visma as the number one team. And then this year, we won a total of 57 races. And we ended up the number one ranked team in the world. And on the way, we also won two Tour de France's. This was 2020 when Tade won his first Tour de France. And then in 2021, when he won his second Tour de France, we've lost the last two. We've ended up second in both years. But we'll see if we can turn that around next year. Um, but altogether, a very successful 
uh, achievement of those stated goals that we had in 2018. So how do we get there? And you know, success in a, in, a, in a team like this is not down to one particular aspect or even a small number of factors. The number of factors that are involved is actually just probably way too much to, to even contemplate or analyze. It's, it's so multifactorial. And so trying to distill it down to any one is impossible. And so I've just highlighted a few. And, uh, and I'll talk about some of them because they relate to me more than others. Um, the ones that don't uh, are the budget. So uh, the team has a budget now of, and it sounds much more impressive in RAND terms, of um, between three quarters of a million and uh, three quarters of a billion and a billion RAND. And that's similar to many of the other top teams. I mean, it still pales into insignificance compared to Formula One, but it's a lot of money. And, and with money, you can get resources. So um, that helps. But like I said, when we went from 2018 to 2019 and even to 2020, the budget and the and the talent were very, very much the same. It's only in recent years that we've been able to, and that's what the budget does. It allows you to effectively buy more talent in the athletes and in the people that are involved in the team. And also obviously all the things that you can implement from a, a scientific perspective or from a performance perspective. So budget does help. And we see that in Formula One and we see that in all sports. But many teams have top budgets and tank. So it, you have to combine everything together. I think management is a really important one. The best teams seem to be run uh, by the best people and in the best possible way. And I'll talk a little bit briefly about that. And then all these other factors, which I'll go through. The ones that I'm not really going to talk about are tactics in any great detail. But tactics are also important. I mean, if you've watched the, team, the, the movie Moneyball, you understand how you can take a budget and use it uh, to be much more effective. And that's one of the things that um, Machin Fernandez, who's our sporting manager, has done, especially this year, because if you look at the, the big races, we didn't win the Tour de France, we didn't win the Vuelta Espana, we didn't win the Giro d'Italia, but we ended up the number one team in the world. And that's by selectively uh, uh, going to races that count uh, more in terms of points um, and 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 where we were, knew we would be the most effective. So, you know, tactical decisions are also a big part of, of success and are important in that. But if we look at the, the ones that uh, I'm going to talk about today, management and teamwork, in an, a high-performance environment, how people uh, work together and how they're managed is so important. You can have uh, poor management and, and a few rotten apples, and they can really ruin... Uh, a, a team environment and and cause everybody to underperform no matter how hard they happen to be trying and so a testament to the three top level management guys uh, our, our team principal Mauro Ginetti who himself was a very successful professional cyclist uh, who lives in Lugano he's a Swiss Italian uh, Italian Swiss you could say and um, uh, Mauro leads the the team overall we have uh, uh, Machin Fernandez, who's the sporting manager, who makes all the sporting decisions in terms of the calendar, the races, and and is uh, uh, the the day to day running of the team. And then Andrea Agostini, who uh, manages all of the sponsors, money, and and PR related stuff. Um, so uh, Andrea, we don't work with directly as a performance team, uh, but obviously that's important from keeping the sponsors happy and and making sure that the budget is is used correctly. Um, so that's the, the over, higher level management. On the performance side, this is what the performance structure looks like. So uh, I report to Mara and, and Machin. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group with the three of us. And, and basically, that's how um, uh, you know we basically discuss the day-to-day -day performance related aspects. And I work very closely with Adrian Ruccino, who's um, one of our partners in the medical practice here, and who's uh, 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 worked very closely with me since 2015. And so uh, Adrian heads up the medical team. And uh, so all of the doctors uh, work with him. And then I head up the performance team, uh, which is, sorry? And, the next and he's the next SASMA president after Sharif. So very important and prominent figure in sports and exercise medicine. Um, but Adrian is a star and, and, and does a great job on the medical side. And that's an important facet that I'll highlight as well. And then we have a, a, a nutritionist who also has an assistant, but who, who um, heads up our nutrition, Borka Pleto Bavar, and David Herrera, who's in, uh, in charge of our biomechanics equipment and TT support. And so that's just the, the structure. And in terms of some of the, the principles that I found that have worked, and I mean, it's not obviously going to be different for different environments, but in our team, 
I think Mara's uh, management style has been incredibly effective in letting people get on with the job. And I, I sort of had to think about it. What, what does he do so well that uh, makes it effective? And, and the five things that I came up with were, I mean, the one thing is he's calm. He's not running around shouting uh, about things that have gone pear-shaped. And um, he is quiet about those, but he's consultative. So he goes to the various people that he needs to to assess what went right, what went wrong, gathers the information. He then contemplates that for a while. And often that can be frustrating because you, you're looking for an answer, you need to move on, but he's going through that process. And then when, he, when he's finally done that, he's decisive. And he'll then inform typically as a group and say, we need to have a meeting. We'll have a meeting on Zoom or on a telephone call. He'll inform us of his decision. The decision is made and we move on. And I think that's been very effective in terms of just in the in the spaces between that people get on with their work and they can be productive. In my own space, um, I think the things that I've been able to bring to the team in terms of making our performance team and before that the medical team a success is I've been lucky enough to have a very broad exposure to the different aspects that I need from, like I said, biomechanics performance testing, physiology, medical, and being able to combine all of those into a very integrative approach and understanding how all the different facets of the performance side fit together and knowing um, what we need to actually spend time and focus on and where we're starting to just get di diverted down uh, little rabbit warrens that, that aren't um, going to yield uh, Im important uh, results. And then how those different things that we want to do affect other things, you know, whether you mess with biomechanics and then a, a rider gets injured or, or it changes uh, various different factors, but knowing how they all fit together, there's no substitute for experience. I mean, I know, you know, if I think back to what I thought I knew 10 years ago versus what I know now, um, it, it's, it, there is just no substitute for spending time in a sport and gathering that experience and then being able to deploy that in that environment. And then part of that time period that you spend gathering experience, you meet various people and you gain connections and having the right connections and knowing who to call on when the time comes makes a big difference. And then working as a team, um, being able to work in a team environment, accepting uh, that other people uh, can do the job better than you can and allowing them to do that, but then still connecting everybody in a cohesive and, and positive environment. I think is really a, an important attribute in terms of getting teams to work properly. And as I said, if you have the wrong personalities, and we've had that along the line, we've had a number of people who have been incredibly knowledgeable, incredibly experienced and have given us a lot, but at the same time have also been disruptive. And those people have ended up moving on simply because uh, you know the, 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 the team cannot tolerate that for too long before it becomes a, a, a firm negative. And so um, personalities are very important. This from the science side, the important thing is that we are informed by science, but I think in a high performance sporting environment, um, from a practical perspective, you also have to make sure that you're not ruled by science. And um, because so many things that we see anecdotally take a good decade or so before the science catches up and the, and the publications are there to support it. So you do at, at many times have to use your knowledge of what we know works and your experience of what you're seeing is changing and your intuition sometimes as to what may be right. Sometimes you, you, you get it wrong, but many times you can get that right and be far ahead of the, the evidence base. But we still publish a good deal of science. I mean, this is just a couple of papers we published this year that still inform the processes that we do. And we do look back at our research and we integrate different aspects into how we structure the calendar, structure training loads and various other things, how we assess athletes in terms of durability, which is a big one now. That is the ability to maintain power outputs despite a, a very high um, work uh, load having been performed typically in excess of three and a half thousand kilojoules. Um, so those are the things that we're now using, um, but we don't stick rigidly to an only evidence-based structure. We do have to move forward, you know, despite the fact that we don't necessarily have evidence to support something. Um, and so that's from a science perspective. The health of the athletes is super important. 
And when I first came on the team, I, I, I was the medical director and, and, and structured the medical team. Adrian is now a medical director, but we have a very strong South African contingent. And I, I, I'm proud to say that South African doctors are, and I've seen this over and over again, our medical systems in South Africa and our training in, in medicine is absolutely at the top of the, of the, 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 the tree in terms of uh, the quality of our doctors. And we see that in, in the team as well. And so we have, uh, even when they're not South Africans, still, still a strong South African connection. You've got Adrian Rutuno at the top there. You've got Jason Suter, who's one of our partners here, and Western Province uh, Medical Director, Rugby, Western Province uh, Rugby Medical Director, Rahib Fredericks, who's in the middle, uh, and David de Klack. And those are all South Africans. And, and then we have Peter Volker, who is Belgian, but he actually did his, uh, uh, he, he, he spent a year with us here uh, training in our medical practice. So there's a strong South African connection there. And he's married to a South African. So there's another South African connection there. And then we have two Italian doctors as well, because, you know, we have our headquarters in Milan. So you've got to have some Italians on the team as well. But there's a very strong South African connection. And the medical team does a great job in terms of not only keeping the athletes healthy and injury free, but also getting them back after injury and illness. And that's imperative. And I mean, in football, the, 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 the data is clear. The number of play days that a player is available to play in football directly correlates with the position of a team in the league. And it's the same in cycling. You've got a team of 30 athletes. You've got sometimes a race on three different a race on each of three different continents. And each race takes seven athletes. So you've got 21 of your 30 athletes racing on three different continents. If you've got five or six injured, you've got no ability to substitute someone out for the next race. So making sure that everybody is healthy is absolutely important. And the medical team does a super job on that. Part of that is our strength and conditioning and rehab team. So we've got uh, Prof. Victor Marino, uh, Spanish, who um, uh, works very closely. He actually gives so much of his time. He goes to each of the athletes' homes and spends up to uh, two, three, four weeks with them, living with them, and and very uh, uh, doing very, very focused rehab with them. And um, we also inform our practices in strength and conditioning and, 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 and the rehab from our own research and from his research. So, so it is evidence-based, um, but a very, very passionate and, and dedicated strength and conditioning and rehab specialist who works with our athletes. So our medical team is, is absolutely a critical part of our success. A big part, and a lot of people ask, you know, why are people in the, in the in, in, why is cycling so fast these days? I mean, if you look at the speed of the peloton and the average speeds and, and, and power outputs that are produced uh, compared to 10 years ago, it's gone up massively. And a huge part of that is um, uh, equipment and, and the technology side of things. Um, if you take a bike from 10 years ago, even you know uh, one of the very best bikes or 20 years ago and you and you go and do uh, a circuit uh, say a 20 kilometer circuit with some climbs and some flat parts and you use a bike uh, that's that's now considered the best uh, that you can get you'll probably end up uh, a minute or two faster over about a 20 kilometer loop and they've done some some uh, tests of that the equipment has advanced dramatically and we have david herrero also spanish who is involved with all of our equipment and biomechanics side um i work very closely with david and, and biomechanics wise we use many of the systems that we've used in our research jubiomized which is a german company out of uh, munster that uh, produces pressure mapping uh, stt which is a spanish system which we've got in our lab here and Yumna, you know our STFE system, your Vicon system costs how much? Uh, six million rand, seven million rand. Um, STT is actually a commercial system that costs about uh, 250,000 rand and, um, and does a very similar job to Vicon and allows you to simply on tripods move the 3D kinematics from one center to another. So when we go to our December training camp, uh, David will bring the entire STT system, we'll install it in a hotel uh, um, boardroom uh, or one, a conference area and basically be able to produce. Uh, so we do do that um, basically in a hotel and that's how technology has evolved, you know, 3D kinematics, what it was only available as a Vicon system 10 years ago. Now you can put it in a hotel room effectively and it costs a fraction of what it used to. Um, a big part of uh, the improvements in performance have been aero testing, not only the time trial bikes, but the road bikes. We do a lot of aero testing. We make small incremental gains, um, but they all add up. 
And that's one of the reasons why the Peloton goes so fast at the moment on the flats. The bikes are so aerodynamic. I mean, a, a simple example is the handlebars. All the handlebars now are completely integrated, uh, completely aerodynamic. Uh, there are no separate parts. Um, wheels have evolved dramatically. Tires, uh, when I was racing as a junior, we used 19 millimeter wide tires. The Tade now rode the Tour de France, he was using 32 millimeter wide tires. So we're talking about uh, you know 60 percent wider tires you'd think that would make you slower it makes you faster because the rolling resistance is lower so you know those kinds of things are tested we do velodrome testing we do equipment testing and david does uh, all of that and brings that together so equipment is definitely a huge factor uh, wind tunnel testing that that's where a lot of money is spent um, and and if you've got the, the budget wind tunnel testing makes a huge difference um, in terms of our time trialing performance they, you know, we've got the same athletes who two years ago were not finishing in the top 10 at major events. And now in any major race, we typically have three to four of our team in the top 10. And that's the difference just from the equipment side. Same athlete, same training, same level, just uh, optimizing uh, the aerodynamics and the equipment. Nutrition is a major aspect of why the peloton is going much faster. So um, Oscar Jugendrup's work and a, and a bunch of other top nutritionists, Andrew's work um, uh, has contributed massively to our understanding of uh, nutrition in endurance sports. You know, 10 years ago, riders uh, were racing. I mean, when I, when I started with the team in 2018, the riders were on a ketogenic diet. Dan Martin was the only rider who refused. And he was probably the only rider who actually finished the, the Tour de France with two legs. Uh, in the team, uh, the riders were were racing with um, you know three or four grams of carbohydrates in a in a bottle. Um, uh, you know now, uh, five years later, uh, on average, our guys are consuming uh, at various different points in depending on the race, 110 uh, grams of carbohydrates per hour. So the nutrition side has made a huge difference. We've got uh, we we employ a periodized nutrition approach. So each of our athletes. Uh, gets a entirely tailored peri uh, periodized nutrition um, without overburdening this slide. Um, the, 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 the point of that is not only to stimulate uh, um, adaptations in terms of their training, so they'll do faster training, they'll do metabolic training, which I'll get to in a second, um, and basically trying to stimulate those training adaptations. We try to optimize their uh, energy expenditure versus the energy uh, intake to optimize their body composition and their mass. Power to weight is a huge thing in cycling. And so you need to get the athletes light, but without compromising their health. And so um, uh, finding that balance is tricky and you need someone who's very hands-on and, and, and looking at the data constantly. And that's Gorka. Gorka is a excellent nutritionist and he em em uh, employs a strategy of periodized nutrition from uh, a daily basis. So every athlete, this is an example of, a, of one of our athletes in February, 2020, it's a long time ago, but the slide's still relevant. And every training session and every day will have a specific focus in terms of their macronutrient composition. So um, the, the types of macronutrients and the total volume of macronutrients is, is tailored on a daily basis. And then even within races, so this is just an example of one stage in the Tour de France, and each athlete will receive an individualized uh, guide. And so at the bottom, each athlete knows for each hour of the race, whether they should be on 100 grams an hour, 60 grams an hour, and what the composition of that should be based on the different charts. So it is incredibly periodized, and, and that's one of the, 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 the ways in which we've been very effective in terms of our nutrition strategy. And one of the, obviously, the big developments is the use of multiple transportable carbohydrates, so a mix of maltodextrin and fructose. And these days, you know, whether it's 60, 40, 50, 50, 70, 30, um, the, the point is that athletes are able to consume way higher volumes of carbohydrate and actually absorb them than uh, what we previously thought the upper limits were. And every time we think we've got the upper limit, three years ago, Andrew, it was 80 grams, wasn't it, or something like that. Now we know 110 is easily tolerable. Some people are pushing 120 grams an hour. So, you know, the energy that you're able to consume, uh, exogenous carbohydrate consumption has gone up massively. And of course, that means the riders go faster. So nutrition is a huge part. Performance testing is important. And we do that um, using two different protocols. So we do a seven-minute step test 
or, or lactate accumulation, metabolic profiling, whichever one you want to call it, fat max test. It's a combination of a bunch of different measurements. And we use that to assess uh, lactate uh, kinematics, uh, uh, fat oxidation rates, and uh, economy. Um, and we then also give the riders an hour break, and we then do a traditional VO2 max test, which is a 20 watt per minute continuous ramp protocol. Um, and we use the data from both of those to inform training intensities and to set training uh, intensities, and also longitudinally to assess progression. Um, we also use that to uh, create a database that allows us to assess new athletes, because now, if any of you are familiar with cycling, you'll see that uh, you know, 18, 19 year olds, 20 year olds are winning all the races when the, uh, 20 years ago, the top riders were all in their late 20s to early 30s. And that's because these athletes are all exposed to um, these uh, elements of technology at a very early part in their development. And so they're arriving in the, in the senior ranks at a very high level. But knowing which athletes have the attributes that are going to make them the next Tade Pogacar or Joanna Swingergaard, are, is important and and so we need data to be able to identify uh, those athletes and 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 performance testing is, a, is an important part of that one thing that is interesting i mean Mike, you're going to laugh at i mean lactate testing so i've i've said a lot about lactate testing but it is something that we still do and it is actually important because your lactate profile does inform you of uh, your, your your maximal oxidative capacity and also other metabolic elements that are important to endurance cycling. And the, and the reason why that's important, if we do a traditional VO2 max test on athletes, and this is an example of an athlete over a three-year period, and what we see is that um, this is old, old data, but it, it's, it's why this uh, happened to, to come about. We see no improvements in VO2 max and peak power output. And if we measure performance in the field, we see the same. Mean maximal power outputs for one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes won't change. What does change is durability, and we weren't measuring that 10 years ago, and we do now. We now do a protocol, a fatiguing protocol, followed by a performance test to see whether or not there's a decline after 3,500 kilojoules. And the reason that declines is because you're running out of energy and various other uh, uh, you know, fatigue-related changes are happening. Um, but what we do see is after a period of exposure to the optimal training uh, methods, we do see a change in the lactate curve. And that is a reflection of the changes in their metabolic capacity. And that's why that step test is so important, because where, where we're seeing things is really at a mitochondrial level, yeah. mitochondrial density, enzyme, and just general capacity. And carbohydrate oxidation and fat oxidation capacity improve, even though your peak power up would be a 2 max and other traditional methods of measuring performance and stratification don't change. And these really Mitochondrial capacity is really the big thing that determines your endurance uh, um, and, and your durability. And James Sprague, my PhD student who's graduating this year, we showed that in terms of the physiological characteristics in lab testing, your fat oxidation rate and carbohydrate oxidation rate really are key determinants, as are your economy, of um, durability. So your ability to use your resources as sparingly as possible. So how do we also measure that? We do... As I said, the step test, we use uh, indirect calorimetry like everybody else, and we measure fat oxidation as well. And then we get this metabolic profile for the athletes. So that's the performance testing that we do. That informs our training prescription. And my colleague in Ego San Milan, who's now um, moved on to Atletico Bilbao into football, but um, his introduction to the team in 2018 was the use of his zone two training, which I've used with my athletes since then. And I've seen, even though there's not a lot of evidence he hasn't produced a lot of research. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that it works. And I've seen that in the many athletes that I've uh, prescribed this to over the last five years. And in your traditional three zone model, it sits in zone two, but it's in the lower half of zone two. So it's that area where from a blood lactate concentration, you're looking at about uh, a one to 1 1.5 millimolar concentration. Okay. So you've got a lot of carbohydrate oxidation without over... Uh, stimulating glycolytic systems, but you're pushing maximal carbohydrate oxidation. We know that that also has a very high flux through fat oxidative uh, 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 mechanisms, and that uh, then stimulates both fat oxidation and carbohydrate oxidation. And we see that with that, there are improvements. And I've seen it myself in terms of 
uh, top triathlete, Matt Troutman, that I coach, and I introduced the same to Matt. And Matt, had, uh, I mean, he's an older athlete, so he really understands how to train, and he had actually trained very effectively. But by introducing this zone two training, and that's his breakdown of, of training between 2019 and 2022. And if we look at his fat oxidation, it increased, despite the fact that we, we are now in a, in a primarily carbohydrate oxidation, sort of uh, glycolytic uh, phase of, of your intensity uh, profile, um, his fat oxidation improved and his lactate curve shifted a little bit to the right. But one thing that did happen was his performance improved as well. And he's had a lot of top results um, during that period. And I've seen that in other athletes as well, employing where they previously had maybe stagnated a little bit and introduced this type of training, they have improved. So we still need to generate some research and, and outputs in it, but um, certainly anecdotally it works. And the other big one that where most of the teams have made huge gains is in altitude training. And we know from uh, uh, Carsten Lundby and, yeah. and, and other researchers, um, if you look at the, the research into altitude training, they've seen gains of about four or 5% in hemoglobin mass over a period of three weeks of altitude exposure to you know, two to two and a half thousand meter altitude exposure. We've had very high success rates by optimizing. And this is, I think is one of the things where we've really made a difference is most athletes that go to altitude end up overtraining in the first week or two when they're at altitude. The, the physiological stress of altitude exposure is such that you can't really push training loads in that first period. And by really looking at, we look at heart rate variability, oxygen saturation, general feeling, and just being quite conservative. We, and this is um, Dave DeClack's MPhil, he, he's, he'll be publishing this data, but this is just some of our data. We've seen changes of on average four and a half percent in hemoglobin mass over a period of 10 days of altitude exposure, which in typically in your traditional research, if you look at the, the, the research that's been published, 10 days is considered insufficient to stimulate hemoglobin mass changes. But we've seen quite drastic changes. And I think that relates to how we're doing things. I know that other teams like Jumbo Visma are also employing other tactics like um, high intensity sprint, so maximal sprint interval training at altitude to stimulate other mechanisms that are resulting in positive adaptive responses and results, uh, vasodilation being a key part of that. And so those are things that we'll be incorporating going forward as well. So those are just two of the kinds of training stimuli. One area that um, I, I was particularly involved in from the beginning was in load monitoring. You know, professional road cyclists have a history of training huge loads, you know, and if you look at 20 years ago, most of the professionals were, were training anywhere between 35 and 45 hours a week. Our riders now average about 20 hours a week um, when they're not racing. And in a race, we can do as little as, or, or between races, as little as six, 15 or 16 hours of training. So the training volumes have come down drastically. And in those days, you know, most of the athletes, and I remember when I was racing professionally, I think I could have done a lot better because I know that I entered most of the big races completely overtrained because that was the thing. You know, you, you, were, you were told that you needed to do more and doing less is often better, but you can only convince an athlete to do less if you can show them the data and show the benefit. And so load monitoring is critical. And we do a number of different things. We have a mix of internal and external load metrics. And um, a lot of that is based on research that uh, we've done here. And to, to just give you like how they in interact, external load metrics, we use training peaks, which is what almost every endurance athlete uses these days, using power data to look at your overall workload compared to, and looking at your acute chronic workload balance. And then we use a mix of internal load metrics. Heart rate variability has really come along a lot in the last uh, decade and is a very reliable tool these days in terms of looking at, at load metrics. We use a self-reported wellness questionnaire, which I'll show you in a second. Then we use a derivative of Rob Lambert's Lambert's and Lambert's submaximal fatigue test, Alice Lambert submaximal cycling test, um, which I used to use. Um, and uh, the problem is that the athletes just didn't want to do it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a 20 minute test effectively. You've got to do it on an indoor trainer when you're a little bit fatigued, you can't get your heart rate up, so it becomes aversive. And so eventually we morphed that and we flipped it. Instead of doing it on heart rate, we do it on power. And we took it from a 15 minute 
20 minute test if you take in the recovery time to a uh, three minute test and the athletes uh, basically you go on a self-paced warm-up on a standardized climb and they do three minutes at a at their functional threshold power which i'll go into now and we use that on a weekly basis and then every four to six weeks which is something that Inigo also implemented in the team we do a battery of blood tests and that has also been useful in identifying those athletes that are decompensating so the weekly self-reported measures, um, we basically just use a drop-down menu and that allows us to quantify. So we actually have a scoring on that. And this is part of Rodeia's uh, master's uh, dissertation, which he'll be, he should have finished by now. And he's a bit, uh, not a bit, a long way behind on, um, but um, he does have a draft out, which is good. But basically the athlete just gets a link in their training peaks. And every day that that link comes up, they just click on it. And then they get these drop down menus and they can score based on uh, the verbal anchors how they feel for these different components, including sleep, stress, overall fatigue, um, and so on. And then they can also do a free form field where they can inform us as well. And that's, you know, obviously you speak to the athlete on WhatsApp, you talk to them on the phone, um, uh, you see them in person, but this just creates a record and it helps when you look back on whether something was successful or not what the kind of different experiences were that the athlete had in relation to their training load. And then you can actually um, analyze uh, retrospectively what went right and what went wrong. HRV, we use ultra human rings. Um, everyone's probably familiar with Aura. Ultra human is a, a UAE based company that does a very similar device. It's a very, very advanced piece of tech. It's amazing what they can fit. And they've just launched this new um, air ring, which is even thinner. It's incredible that you can have a ring that fits on your finger that has a battery that lasts five days and measures everything from movement to photoplethysmography to oxygen sats to now they're even measuring ECG through the ring to look at uh, identify arrhythmias in, in people who are at risk and so forth. So incredible piece of tech and we measure HRV on a daily basis. We measure only nocturnal HRV and, and resting heart rate to make sure that we get a better baseline. We do the SFT test. So as I said, instead of doing it on heart rate, we now anchor power. So the rider does a three minute effort at their functional threshold power, which is a standard uh, workload in cycling. And we measure then their uh, 15 point RPE scale rating. So their uh, rating of perceived exertion. We measure their heart rate response. And then at the end of the test, they also give us a time to exhaustion rating in terms of if they continued at that power, how long would they be able to maintain it? And subjectively, how do they feel about that? And that's actually been found to be quite robust. This is some of the data that Rode showed at the SASMA conference last year. And so um, this is the data that we'll be publishing, but there are good correlations between the self-reported questionnaire and the SFT data and the external load metrics from training peaks. So it is a robust method and um, those papers will be published in the coming three to six months, hopefully. And then, as I said, we do a blood panel every four to six weeks, and um, that's informed by David Burkhoff's uh, paper, very useful paper in terms of looking at the evidence for those different blood markers and what they represent. And as I said, that's been quite useful as well in terms of identifying athletes that aren't able to tolerate the training loads and where those other metrics sometimes have actually missed some of the, uh, the, the, the decompensation. Um, but we're able to pick it up. Um, obviously, there's a duration and interval. So, um, uh, you know, the, the fact is that it's not that sensitive to acute changes, but certainly you can interrupt a chronic downward cycle in an athlete uh, when you see that these blood results are abnormal. Um, the other things that we do, and we've done various things over time, anthropometrics get measured regularly every time an athlete gets to the race. Um, either the doctor at the race or if Gork is there, will do their sum of seven skin folds and take their body mass so that we keep a, a key eye on the trend and make sure that athletes aren't suddenly going in the wrong direction. Sometimes they'll, on their own volition, think that they need to lose weight because they've got an upcoming goal and they get anxious about the result and they start um, restricting the caloric intake. We pick that up early in the races leading up to that and then um, obviously intervene. We've done things like non-invasive muscle glycogen uh, measurements using Inigo's protocol um, using muscle sound, um, uh, an ultrasound based technique that looks at the density of muscle and can measure muscle glycogen concentration. Those are the correlations between a biopsy and, and muscle sound methods. It's quite a useful technique and that can actually be quite useful. We've done, for instance, we've picked up when athletes are on their way to injury. So muscle that starts to develop a, an overuse injury 
uh, has lower glycogen storage capacity, and we've seen asymmetries between, for instance, hamstring muscles in terms of their glycogen concentration. We've seen athletes that are underfueling in stage races where we've seen other athletes stabilize at sort of 50, 40, 50% of their muscle glycogen after three, four days of racing, another athlete keeps declining. We know that they're not consuming enough calories. And then when you have an intervention, you can see it pop back up again. So that's just one of those um, unusual ones. We've even done using our own portable spectrophotometer on the bus, uh, measuring reactive oxidative species, and then having different uh, strategies in terms of antioxidant strategies in the Tour de France and other Grand Tour races. So those are the sort of links that you can go to when you've got the resources and you start um, thinking out the box. Some of them are wasted time, but but they you know just gives you an insight into some of the different things that we can do in terms of monitoring load. And I think that's about enough time because that's a lot that I've covered. Obviously, the one thing that I have left out in, in this one is that no sport is uh, is 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 what it is without the emotions. And so I'll play you a little um, clip. Um, a little We then lost it to Prima Roglic, and uh, uh, the had the white right jersey, the very last day, the baby for Paris. Sade wanted to stay in the but in the final time trial, he managed to overturn a deficit to win the Tour de France by the smallest margin since the Vermont win. There have been many other emotional moments, um, and that was actually, those are just pictures captured the moment um, uh, Roglic crossed the line and we realized that we had won the Tour de France for the first time, um, and there have been many other highlights along the way. So I hope you enjoyed that small small peek into the back of what happens. There's a lot more that goes on. As I said, I can't capture all the different variables, but that just gives you some idea of, uh, of what we get up to uh, at UAE Team Emirates. Thank you.